Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby. This is uh, lecture number six in my continuing series of lectures on root theory versus tissue stress theory. And uh, in today's lecture, we're going to be discussing the development of tissue stress theory uh, from the beginnings of root theory when I was being taught as a student and I also taught as a biomechanics fellow in 1984 to 1985. Then during that time during my biomechanics fellowship started to have the seeds of the ideas that eventually uh, led to uh, a development of this tissue stress theory uh, which was aided by uh, Tom McPoyle and Gary Hunt in um, 1995. So um, let's go back uh, to uh, just a brief review of the previous five lectures, a little bit of the history. Uh, as a student, but after student, I was taught root theory exclusively. Uh, there was very little mention in root theory about discussing the internal loading forces within the tissues, ligaments, tendons, muscles, cartilage, bone of the lower extremity. Uh, when root theory was taught, it was basically taught how to bisect the heel, measure subtalar joint neutral, and order uh, and other biomechanical measurements, doing gait examinations, and trying to develop an idea around that this orthotic that was typically vertically balanced could treat just about all pathologies, saying it would quote unquote prevent a compensations for uh, deformities of the foot, uh, being based on Root's idea that the normal foot had a neutral subtelogen position, had a vertical calcaneus, had a vertical distal third of the tibia and uh, on through his eight biophysical criteria for normalcy. Uh, as a resident, I became, as a, I'm sorry, as a biomechanics fellow, I became dismayed by the lack of correlation to the root measurements, to the pathology I was seeing and the patients I was treating at the time. And along with my exploration and research on the subtelogen axis location and also on my doing the research on the anterior axial radiograph that was eventually published uh, after my fellowship where we found that the medial calcaneal tubercle was a rounded surface and the calcaneus did not have any internal stability imparted by the plantar structural uh, shape of the plantar calcaneus then I had um, uh, come to the conclusion that uh, things didn't quite work like uh, like Root and my biomechanics professors were uh, discussing. As I mentioned in the last lecture, I came up with the idea of the uh, medial heel Skype technique, which further cemented my opinion that indeed the Root model of orthotic prescription was not the best prescription uh, for all people and that things such as a uh, Blake inverted orthosis, which I had uh, made for Rich Blake during my student years and was making myself during my biomechanics fellowship and led on to the development of the, uh, my development of the medial heel Skype technique, which was published in 1992. So th these factors combined uh, had led me to believe that Indeed, we had to take into consideration that the foot orthosis would need to be modified in order to more directly um, correct the internal forces, pathological forces that are causing the pathology of the patient. As such, at the time I was writing monthly newsletters for Precision and Intercast, and when one of the newsletters I wrote Around the time that the Medial Heel Sky paper was published in March of 1992, I wrote this newsletter, and the uh, title of the newsletter is called uh, Thinking Like an Engineer. And, uh, and this was published, I wrote this in March of 1992, and uh, in this article, a two-page article, I voiced my concerns about the education we were getting utilizing the root model and that I thought we should be as podiatrists thinking more like a structural engineer where we're trying to model the foot and determine the internal loading forces acting on the structural components of the foot of large extremity rather than spending all of our time measuring heel bisection, sub joint neutral, and then basically making the orthotic to the patient's foot structure versus to the patient's pathology. And um, 
I said in this article, unfortunately for many of us, our podiatric biomechanics education instructed us to simply measure externally apparent deformities of the foot and lower extremities like tibial varum, uh, rear foot varus, forefoot rear foot relationship to determine the correct orthosis prescription for the patient. Our podiatric biomechanics education involved very little instruction in regards to internal tension forces, compression or torsional forces which occur within the structural components of the foot and lower extremity. And I believe that an analysis of externally measurable deformities of the foot and lower extremity does not give us near enough information in order to accurately predict the mechanical behavior of the foot and the lower extremities during weight bearing activities and therefore this method is insufficient to prescribe the best orthoses for our patients. So this was March of 1992 when I was coming to the realization that our the model that Root had provided us with was uh, insufficient to predict pathology and also insufficient to predict gait function. And, uh, and so, as such, it would be a relatively inefficient method by which to best prescribe foot orthosis. So at that time, I had been uh, mulling this idea over my mind, trying to come up with an idea of how to uh, better approach the evaluation and treatment of patients with foot orthoses. And then in, uh, in 1995, it came to my attention that one of my, um, my colleagues in the physical therapy profession, Tom McPoyle and his colleague uh, Gary Hunt, had published a paper. And this paper was uh, entitled Evaluation and Management of Foot and Ankle Disorders, Present Problems and Future Directions. And uh, just a little side note on Tom McPoyle, uh, Tom is a PhD and uh, physical PhD in biomechanics as him and Mark Cornwall have done a lot of the best research on foot kinematics and uh, it's uh, I had first met Tom at around this time uh, and uh, giving a lecture with them and it is interesting that we both grew up in South Sacramento in California we actually used to swim at the same uh, swimming pool as children he was a few years older but we actually grew up only about two miles away from each other, uh, but never knew each other until we had uh, started reading each other's papers. Anyway, the beauty of the McPoyle and Hunt paper that was published in June of 1995 in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy was that they discussed this uh, the problems with the root model. And one of the uh, problems with the root model is that they discussed that the reliability of the measurements of the uh, root model are suspect since all the papers of that date showed that examiners had difficulty in uh, making reliable me measurements, that the criteria for normalcy that root proposed is suspect because there's, uh, there's very few people that were actually had a normal structure and also that the subtalar joint uh, root proposed would be in neutral somewhere between mid stance and propulsion, which is something that uh, that McPoyle had actually not found in, in their research. And so he uh, he proposed this new model. It was called he called it the tissue stress model, and it's him and Gary Hunt did this paper and talked about this tissue stress model as a basis for evaluation. Here we have the tissue stress model. And uh, in this model, they go through the various steps. And um, that was um, really when I heard this tissue stress model and saw this paper, I said, aha, this is, this is what I've been searching for uh, for the past three or four years as a name to uh, give a better name for the way that I've been already um, evaluating patients and, and uh, trying to apply my ideas on subtelligent axis location, rotational equilibrium, and internal stresses and forces acting in the foot as a way to better prescribe foot orthosis. So, so in, um, in the ensuing years, I had, come, uh, I had come up with this idea of uh, trying to talk more about this tissue stress theory and combining it with the uh, subtelligent axis location or rotational equilibrium concepts I'd already published and uh, my, uh, one of my friends and colleagues and former biomechanics fellows and uh, students, Eric Fuller, who was, did his biomechanics fellowship from 1988 to 1989, four years after I did it, 
and I came up with the a uh, chapter that was published in uh, Stephen Albert and Sarah Curran's book. Uh, the chapter, the title of the uh, book is Lower Extremity Biomechanics, and our chapter was um, Subtalar Joint Equilibrium and Tissue Stress Approach to Biomechanical Therapy of the Foot and Lower Extremity. And this is a chapter that we wrote and uh, finished writing in April 2005. Unfortunately, the chapter and our the book wasn't published until eight years later in 2013. But in that book, we discussed uh, the tissue stress approach. We talked about McPoyle and Hunt's paper in that what we're trying to do with the tissue stress approach is trying to um, come up with a better way of uh, evaluating and ordering uh, orthotics for a patient. So both in McPoyle and Hunt's tissue, uh, paper where they introduced the tissue stress model and our chapter in, uh, that we wrote approximately uh, 10 years after uh, McPoyle and Hunt's paper we discuss the evaluation method uh, and uh, and to do tissue stress in the clinical environment first of all what we need to do is first identify the tissues that are injured uh, so is it a posterior tibial tendon is it a deltoid ligament is it the tarsal tunnel uh, where the posterior tibial nerve may be um, becoming injured and causing tarsal tunnel syndrome is it on the lateral ankle sinus tarsi syndrome? Is it on the plantar foot, maybe in the plantar fascia, or possibly a sesamoiditis, or what have you? So we need to know the anatomy, and that's our first part of the evaluation. Second part of the evaluation tissue stress model in the clinical sense is to identify the structural and functional variables that are causing the excess stress that's causing the pathology to the foot and arch extremity. Now this may involve uh, looking at the foot structurally, uh, trying to determine uh, if there's any abnormalities in the foot structure versus what a uh, more average foot would look like. Uh, to put the foot through ranges of motion, um, we may check ankle dorsiflexion, we're going to be doing gait examination, we may do a special test, and also get it from the patient's history what may have happened and caused this injury to occur. And then then the step, the last step is going to be formulating a mechanical protocol and physical therapy protocol that's going to not only um, uh, treat the patient's excess pathology, excess stresses uh, that are causing that pathology in the tissues that are injured, but also formulate a treatment plan that's going to allow them to heal most effectively uh, and with the least amount of pain and with the greatest mobility. And so if we're going to be using foot orthosis in that mechanical treatment plan, the foot orthoses need to have three goals. The first goal of foot orthosis therapy is to uh, reduce the pathological loading forces on the injured structures of the foot and extremity. The second goal is going to be to try to, at the same time, optimize gait function so that we can improve the gait. In other words, if they're undergoing late mid-stance pronation, which is abnormal gait function, we want to eliminate that and try to improve the gait function so they walk better uh, by visual gait examination or uh, measured by uh, other methods. And in so doing, by eliminating the pathological stresses to heal the injured structures and optimizing gait function, we don't want to be causing any other pathologies to occur. So we don't want to have the uh, treatment that we're using by tissue stress causing other pathologies over time. So that means we're going to have to follow these patients over time to see if the uh, foot orthoses or other treatments we've used are, are causing uh, problems for the patient. And these are outlined, uh, these uh, concepts are outlined in the chapter that uh, Eric Fuller and I did in uh, Stephen Albert's book and in great detail with, uh, with many models being used to explain how we uh, may invert the orthosis or use a medial heel sky, let's say for posterior tibial ten uh, tension excesses causing posterior tibial tendon and pathology. Uh, we may talk about everting orthosis using valgus wedges for perineal tendon pathology. We may be using um, a foot orthosis to support the arch to take the tension off the plantar fascia. And, and, and the basis of the tissue stress theory is many times we're using the foot orthosis to duplicate the function of the injured structure. So in the case of the posterior tibial tendon uh, pathology, where excessive tension loads are causing posterior tibial tendonitis or posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. We're using the inverted uh, orthotic 
that may mean a higher medial arch, uh, a medial heel sky, or inverting the heel sky, or even a Blake inverted orthosis technique to uh, cause external supination moment so that the posterior tibial won't need to uh, be causing so much internal supination moment at the subtalar joint. So in other words, what we're doing is trying to put a supination moment on the subtalar joint with the orthotic so that the posterior tibial tendon won't have to during gait. In the same instance, we may look at perineal tendinopathy where a lateral axis is causing excessive posterior, t I'm sorry, perineal, uh, perineus brevis or perineus longus tendon loads, excessive loads in those tendons causing pathology. And though since the perineals are the only muscles that cause pronation, uh, pronation moments on the subtalar joint, we are going to use our foot orthosis to evert the foot by putting pronation forces or moments on the foot by doing a valgus wedge or a lateral heel sky or an everted balancing position of the foot orthosis in order to put pronation forces on the subtalar joint that are going to be limiting the need for the central nervous system to use the perineals to add those uh, super, uh, pronation loads, uh, pron internal pronation moments to the foot through the perineal uh, muscle activity and perineal tendons. We may also look at tissue stress as uh, supporting the medial arch, as I said before, for plantar fasciitis. The plantar fascia produces a arch raising moment, and if the foot orthosis can produce an arch raising moment, then the plantar fascia will have less load on it because the foot orthosis is duplicating the function. So these are some of the concepts of the tissue stress theory, and I, I think it makes much more, much better mechanical sense uh, from not only a biomechanics standpoint, but also from an engineering standpoint, and understanding that the internal loads and uh, through the foot and lower extremity and excessive pathological loads are what cause a majority of the injuries we see uh, as podiatrists treating our patients with mechanical foot pathology that it's going to be important for us to uh, move away from the very limited root concepts where we're treating patients on their foot deformities and foot measurements externally and being a little more um, scientific using more engineering concepts, uh, using engineering concepts, thinking more like engineers and using this tissue stress model in order to better treat our patients uh, more effectively uh, with foot orthoses to uh, eliminate their pathologies, get them to walk better and prevent other pathologies from occurring. Thank you.